Well, I have been having a little go round with uh, everybody's favorite Watchtower apologist, Justice Forever, and um, I was pointing out to him, um, what did he say about, yeah. You have the nerve to laugh at Trinitarian logic when yours wasn't heard of for four centuries after Christ, and God couldn't bother to keep it alive between the 600s and the 1500s. And he's like, it's alive today, so it was kept alive. It was hard, though. Remember, you people were burning people at the stake. Let's just ignore what the, all the stuff the Aryans did when they uh, were wearing the crown, so to speak, uh, in the 300s, but yeah, whatever. Um, it was heard of during Christ during the Apostles' time, of course. Then the great apostasy, you, came in and dominated and oppressed us for a while. To which I pointed out, the great apostasy. <laughs> so the Apostles failed miserably to make disciples of anyone. They failed in their mandate given, to, given by Jesus in Matthew 28, 19. And the oneness, the Sabbath keepers, the people with Mormon theology, all say that there's an apostasy because their doctrines weren't heard of until later, so get in line. And guess what? The Arians from the 1500s didn't come from underground groups. They came out of the Roman Catholic Church, out of the Anglican Church. They weren't around. That's because Arianism was dead as a doornail till then. Now, the apostles made disciples, he said. The apostasy overshadowed them. Many went underground. Some were executed by your bloodthirsty people. Well, Putting aside that in the 100s, the church had no power whatsoever to execute anyone, um, I want to examine his statement. The apostles made disciples, the apostasy overshadowed them, many of them went underground. Now, this is a, an argument I've trotted out in the past, so if you've heard it before, don't roll your eyes too much. Uh, this here is the letter to St. Ignatius of St. Ignatius of Antioch to the church at Ephesus. Ignatius writing to them in the year 106-107. So, going down to chapter 7, this is what Ignatius, along with his brothers in Ephesus, believe about Jesus Christ. Some of you are in the habit of caring, whoop, caring about the name of Jesus Christ in wicked... The heck? All right, I'm, I'm going to highlight it. This thing's not cooperating with me. There we go. All right, here we go. Um, some of, for some are in the habit of caring about the name of Jesus Christ in wicked guile, yet they practice things unworthy of God, whom you must flee as you would wild beasts. They are ravening dogs who bite secretly, against whom you must be on your guard, inasmuch as they are men who can scarcely be cured. There is one physician who is possessed of both flesh and spirit. Both made and not made. Greek is generato, kai a generato. God existing in flesh. True life and death, both of Mary and of God, first passable, then impassable. Even Jesus Christ our Lord. Ignatius and the Ephesians, in the year 107, believed that Jesus Christ was both made as man and not made as God. Now, Justice Forever, here's my challenge to you. You're going to say Ephesus in 107 is an apostate church. Here's my question then. If Ephesus was an apostate church, why was Jesus so irresponsible as to not warn them for this apostasy that was coming? Here is Jesus talking to Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. This is in 96 AD, just 10 years prior. Here's what he says to them. These are the words of him that holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deed, your hard work, your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people. You have tested those who claim to be an apost apostles but are not. You have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you had fallen. Repent and do things that you did at first. In other words, Ephesus was in pretty good shape. I mean, yeah, their, their zeal was cooling off, and that's not good. But all in all, um, considering some of the more scathing uh, rebukes he gave some of the churches 
in the in the let in the book of Revelation, Ephesus is in okay shape. And no warning of apostasy. Now look at look at what he talks to look look what he says to Smyrna. Um I know your afflictions in, in your poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who suffer you, uh, slander you, who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison and test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days, but be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as the victor's crown. So, apparently a Big time test was about to hit Smyrna, and Jesus warned them of it. If such a frank apostasy was about to hit Ephesus, why didn't Jesus warn them of it, Justice Forever? That's what I want to ask you. That makes Jesus look a little bit irresponsible, if you ask me. Uh, using Occam's razor here, Justice, why don't we just conclude that Maybe Ephesus was in okay shape in 96, except for its zeal cooling off, and it was in the same shape that it was in 107, that it was in 96. During that time, the Ephesians believed that Jesus was uncreated deity. That's my question for you, Justice. Why is Jesus so irresponsible? Thanks.